we have to get a clear understanding of the Bible. And this next subject is going to try to clarify a very, very important scripture that's had a lot of controversy. And I think it's had a lot of, well, to an extent, behind the scenes hate mail from people who are asking us to wave a miracle wand over their secular life. Uh, and we want to clarify again, we did not set up anybody to go get a mortgage, a loan at the bank, whether it be for a car, a boat, or anything else. We never told anybody to go into debt. We never told anybody to go in there and create any more adhesive contracts. I always ask people, why do they go and get themselves into debt if they don't have the money? I can understand that one of the things that may be the hardest thing to pay at times is the shelter. Okay, but keep it down to the minimal. It's amazing what you can live under if you try to keep that to a minimal expense. <clears throat> but when people go out and borrow $300,000 and come back to me and say, I don't know how I'm going to handle this. And then they say, but I want to keep the property. I'm going, why are you even in something like that? So I can understand the renter better than I can understand the party who wants to be the owner. They were just entrapped into something by their own consent. If you don't have that money, don't be involved. So we're telling people to keep their, their levels of encumbrance low at this moment because they'll give them more time to research, more time to study, and they'll have less anxiety at night because they'll have less debt to deal with. If you can't afford to be by yourself, then maybe it's better to team up with someone to share that expense. And I know that's not really a concept that's been going well in North American society because we've always told people that they could go and own their own castle. And this has created a huge amount of debt worldwide because the people can't afford the castles that they're trying to own. So, our video in here at this moment is dealing with Luke 14, 33, and I'm going to read it. So we're going to go very slow. I guess I'm bringing you again to God's word because God's word deals with law and it deals with grace. When man was under the law and then when man was freed from by grace, what was Jesus meaning in Luke 1433 and what I'm asking people to do is break down every word in that verse look at the look at the verses before look at the verses after then break down that verse after you've got an understanding of the context of what was before it and after and then start to see the light peel the darkness away and you will understand those words are words of diction. We use diction to speak. If you don't understand those words, and then you just assume a meaning is there, you could be way off. So, in my direction, I put the time on that to help people, and I hope that they do their due diligence to see if that is true also. Research the scriptures, but research at least the language that you speak to find out what those words mean. Don't assume they mean something because some pastor told you that's what it means. Check it out. So Luke 14, 33 says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Does this sound like it's asking someone that they, to be an owner in order to be a disciple of Christ? Could a disciple of Christ be an owner of his possessions according to that scripture? So he's not an owner. And all in law, even the law books, state that someone participating in an aggregate. And you know what you get out of the ground on an aggregate? Gravel. Isn't it amazing the word grave is in gravel? Are you going to be part of those that from dust you are to in dust you will return? And so our plan is very industrious. Extracting things out of the ground. For what purpose? You can't take it with you, but everybody thinks they own it. When they believe the illusion that someone's going to advocate their law position to pass it down to somebody else. 
But law is not grace. So are we going to be working to try to solve something in law that we can't fix? Maybe we can't even pay for it. Isn't that what the message was in the Bible, that we could not earn our salvation? It required grace. But in the world of man, what it will do is we'll grace you the right to break the law. That's grace. That's not the grace spoken of in Scripture. Don't confuse that. They call grace a license. A license is permission to break the law, to use something you couldn't use, but you can use it, but then you pay a penalty for using it, so you're agreeing ahead of time in consent that you'll pay all the duties, debts, and obligations for that. We'll call that the line of duty, the line of credit. Yeah, we'll give you a line of credit as well as you're willing to pay for it. Pretty simple. So when we read that scripture, let's not try to confuse it and rationalize it because it's not convenient. Because the truth may not be working well in what we're in in the immediate. I make the comment, truth doesn't work in the world of fiction. If you touch something that's fictional, you will work for it, but you will get nothing at the end. Why? Because James 5 tells you what happens at the end. Because those running the world that are only seeking wealth, greed, profit, mammon, have this in store for you. James 5 is very clear in this subject. It says, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, speaking about those that are rich, which of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. We know God's in his Sabbath day. He said after he made man, he rested. That was the seventh day. But man's at unrest because he refuses grace. And if something is consciously wrong in the world of man and it's contracted for you even to be in it by your own voluntary behavior to be involved by consent, you cannot blame that system because you're involved in it. If you are doing something that touches the public interest, you're responsible for it. Because how else could it operate? Christ said you couldn't be involved in the aggregate. Which would make sense because you wouldn't be part of the mass. Everything in scripture is about living in the spirit, not in the body. The body was the carnal, the flesh. That's why fasting was so important even for Christians to do. Because it denied their carnal instincts that they relied on. They actually denied the food of that body because they had to be reaching something more spiritual by going in that direction. They were relying on God looking after their spirit while they're denying the carnal physical requirements of the flesh. And that's why when people generally say they've come off of a fast, they feel very, very spiritually enlightened. And we know that the nation of Israel, the people fasted. Fasting was there. So, are we in a direction to understand that maybe you're going to have to lose your life in that world in order to gain it? Because we were seeking a better country according to Scripture, a new Jerusalem of above, so we are more like sojourners here. We're not really owners. We're almost very similar to what was going on with Abraham. It seems like we're wandering, but we really haven't lost the inheritance. It's just the world that's around us right now is all carnal sin and greed with a very small timeline left for those that keep down that direction. We know that the meek will inherit the earth, not the, not the greedy. So the prophecy, we know there's people out there now, they may look like they have it, but they're not going to have it for long. 
Because we know that the time with God is very, very, very small. When you compare what God views as a day compared to what man views, a thousand years like a day, so man hasn't been here very long, has he? And therefore, the time that man's been here is only a drop in the bucket compared to infinity. Man was once e eternal until he sinned. Then he removed God's spirit and the direct current left him, the spirit of God, and then his battery only lasted so long. Very similar to how he could run an automobile with strictly a battery without an alternator. Just view Christ as the alternator to recharge your battery because you needed Christ in order to return to the Father. So he's placed an alternator in there for you. You cannot have civil rights as a Christian. Because a Christian is to be peaceful. Civil has to do with the military and the militia. Do not confuse yourself. Look it up in the law. Civil is military. It's a military concept of a militia of those that could be called in at any moment to bear arms for those that demand that of them. It is impossible to be a conscientious objector to any war, to war in any form, if you have a form of war in your name. Because you, by consenting to energize that, would be required to come in and honor that you were using it. They just haven't called you in yet. Just consider you're in the reserves most likely the Federal Reserve. So, our concern right now, do you understand those concepts? Review the video, go back. Can a Christian be civil? Review the word civil. Can we abandon that? Well, if being a civilian and the right to own property and the right to bear arms and the right to all these things we're talking about requires your consent to surety that, and then you realize that the scripture seems to point to the contrary, well, then you may have to adjust your thinking in your heart. So therefore, I can't see the word civil attached to a Christian from what I'm understanding in the word peace. Christ didn't leave us money, he left us peace, to rest in peace, to enter God's rest day. Our next videos are going to further clarify this and what the direction I believe that I will be doing as best I can in communication, that I do by notice, because everything is by notice. And I think it clarifies the point so that you don't expect the world you're living in to automatically know what you're doing if you don't tell them. And this could be the largest declaration of your faith to the public that you will ever do. But you cannot play both sides in this. You cannot sit on the fence. When you're using both jurisdictions and you attach the two together, you extinguish the one that you had by consenting to surety the other. So if you place your given name in beside something that is identifying you as an unbeliever, you're surety the debt. You're surety anything you do with that name. But you extinguish your credibility name because you're now only seen as the surety for the other side. And therefore, they will hold you to it. We'll clarify further in the next videos.